welcome everybody to our tutorial for this afternoon, Statistical Methods for Open Set Recognition. I am Walter Shire from the University of Notre Dame. My co-presenter is Terry Bolt here in the front, <laughs> uh, mugging for the camera that's recording us. Um, for the next four hours, minus a break somewhere around 3.30, we're going to tell you about um, some interesting emerging work uh, in statistical learning that helps us understand how to deal with unknown inputs coming into our learning systems. Um, this is kind of a new spin on, on machine learning since a lot of what we deal with typically uh, involves closed data sets uh, where at training time we have a lot of information and in fact in most cases complete information and then we go off and test in that same universe uh, and this of course is not a realistic portrayal of what we have to deal with in the real world. Um, just a few notes on the tutorial itself. There is a companion website um, you can go to and uh, all the material is uh, available there. So this would be the slides uh, for all three uh, sections of the tutorial, as well as some software that we've developed, uh, some new algorithms that might be of interest, um, a software library for statistical estimation for some of the extreme value theory techniques we're going to talk about today. All that stuff is up there. Um, links to papers as well uh, from our group and other groups uh, that we'll discuss. Um, if you can't remember this, this URL here, uh, which is quite long, uh, just go to the CVPR 2016 website, and there's a link there. Uh, you can get everything. And don't hesitate to, of course, um, uh, reach out if you can't find something that is of interest. Um, just to get uh, a, a quick sense of who's in the audience, how many of you are, are graduate students? What's the number? How many are faculty? Anybody? Oh, good. And how many are, are, are uh, industrial folks? I know at least one person in the back. Yeah. OK, excellent. So, so we have a good mix. Um, that's great. This is a small enough group where I think if you have questions as we're going along, uh, don't hesitate to, to interrupt either me or Terry, and we'll ha be happy to, to have a discussion. Um, you know, if, if there's something that the group may want to discuss too, um, you know, feel free to throw an idea out, and uh, we, can, we can take a break from the lecture itself uh, to dig deeper into uh, whatever is troubling you. Um, OK, so the first part of this tutorial um, is just an introduction to this problem. I'm going to uh, set the stage uh, in, in terms of data sets and, and what's the limitation of, of data set style testing. Uh, when we start to think about open set recognition, I'm going to move towards a formal definition of open set recognition itself. Uh, and this will help us then develop some algorithms later on in this tutorial. Um, so here is, is kind of what we have in, in 2016 when it comes to computer vision evaluation. Um, there are many, many data sets out there. Uh, Depending on what you're doing in computer vision, there is probably some canonical data set that you think about. Uh, in object recognition, of course, that would be something like ImageNet. Um, but there are many different alternatives out there uh, in the object recognition world. Uh, here I'm showing um, a subset of uh, the ImageNet challenge, uh, which is known as Places2, which is just you know, groupings of, of various places. And the idea is at training time, uh, we assume that we have examples from all these classes, uh, airfield, campsite, gas station, water park, mountain. Uh, we're going to look at examples of these, we're going to train our classifiers, and then we're going to move to a test set which has the ex exact same categories. Of course, the test set is not going to have the exact same images, there'll be different images, um, but we've had a priori knowledge um, to train classifiers that can ideally deal with new examples of those known classes. Um, and, and this is basically how we proceed uh, in most cases. Um, you know, face recognition is the same story. Um, even when we're doing something more basic, like evaluating, say, edge detection, it's the same story. We have these closed data sets. Um, and, and this is great in, in a controlled evaluation sense because this um, allows us to track progress. Um, we can't figure out uh, how well we're doing if we don't have some established baselines. Uh, so that's important, and we should still keep doing that. Um, the downside to doing this um, is that what do you do when you set your vision system out into the real world? You're going to see things that are outside the data set. Um, what if your classifiers can't handle that because they have no way to reject those unknown inputs? Uh, because they only know about this visual world. Um, that's a big question. Now, of course, you may be thinking, oh, what about detection? Uh, detectors solve this problem, right? Uh, well, as it turns out, um, even in data sets designed for detection, we have closed set scenarios. Um, you may have some background classes in training that are very compatible, statistically speaking, to the background classes you see at testing. Uh, you're essentially learning the biases within the data set, and that's not really open set testing. Um, so this is still a problem even for detection-oriented tasks. Um, thinking about something like autonomous vehicles, um, this is going to be a huge growing problem for the field. 
uh, because we don't know what to expect, uh, even in settings like uh, a street where there are some well-defined features like the road itself. We know there are going to be cars driving with us or against us in traffic. There's probably houses lining the street. Uh, but various other unknowns may pop up. What if there is, say, a woman uh, walking down the street with a baby carriage and we never train the system on the car to identify that? Uh, maybe they're going to cross the street at some point. Um, if you can't identify that, that could be a serious limitation of your system. Uh, so something like an open set recognition scenario would be, you know, look for blue Ford sedans in an image like this while rejecting trees, signs, telephone poles, etc. All these other things that were extraneous to this particular detection task. Um, Again, very, very common setup for natural or biological vision. We do this all the time as people, uh, but something machines are just not well adapted to at the moment. Um, what does this mean in a more abstract sense for classification? Um, here we can pretend we have a little multi-class problem where we have uh, four different classes. We have training examples for all those classes. Um, you can see all the training points are the hollow circles here. Um, and, and that's great, we can figure out what the decision boundaries are based on uh, that known training data. But the trouble is, uh, we're always undersampling the visual world because, well, the world is complicated. Um, there's a practically infinite number of scenes one can experience in the real world. Uh, and of course, it's not tractable to handle at training time. Uh, so a small cluster of data in this much larger world. Uh, so notice, after we've trained our decision boundaries here, um, you know, these vertical lines, uh, we're now expend extending very far away from the support of that training data. Uh, what does that mean? What if other classes pop up in these large, vacuous spaces that we've assigned a semantically meaningful label to, perhaps, when we created this classifier, uh, but had no real basis to label space so far away from the training data? That's a huge problem. So remember these terms, closed space and open space. Open space especially is going to be very important as we move to a theoretical formulation of this problem. Um, so of course this is not new. I didn't invent open set recognition. Terry sitting here did not invent open set recognition. Um, uh, others have thought about this before. And going way back, you can turn back to the pattern recognition literature and find uh, various questions popping up. Um, for instance, um, you know, what, what do we do for multi-class recognition in an open setting? Um, what is recognition in general? Do we have a good handle on that? It turns out there's a lot of uh, uh, different opinions out there um, that you know, people argue about. Um, you know, is it really ser a series of binary classifications? Typically when we think about multi-class classification, we build ensembles of classifiers that are binary in nature. Very, very common way to approach the problem. Um, of course, there's more than one way to do it. Um, maybe it's really a search performed for each possible class. Uh, and then again, we have the open set problem cropping back in. What if some of those classes are ill-sampled, not sampled at all, or simply undefined? Um, big, big question where we're trying to figure out what exactly the regime is we're in to do the classification to begin with. Um, and pattern recognition, they've posed a lot of good questions, but there's no definitive answer to this question. Uh, so we need to think about that. Um, now, at least one per talk I give uh, these days, I like to invoke my pal here, Don Rumsfeld. <laughs> Um, who, among other things, is well remembered for a speech he gave on the eve of the invasion of Iraq, which began, there are known knowns. And he went on to enumerate a number of different interesting categories. Uh, when it comes to things we know, things we don't know, and things we don't know we don't know. Um, now, there was a lot of confusion after he gave this talk. Uh, some people thought it was nonsense, but it actually was amazingly insightful. Um, of course, he was talking about um, uh, foreign policy uh, and international security, uh, but what he had to say um, has a lot of truth uh, for machine learning, as it turns out. Um, Rumsfeld claimed that there were no knowns. These are things we know we know. Um, that's good. Uh, you know, we can make decisions based on that knowledge. Uh, he also acknowledged there are things that we know we don't know, um, and we can think of all sorts of interesting cases where, where, where that's an issue. Um, uh, I know, for instance, we know we don't know all of the classes we could possibly encounter at testing time in machine learning. Um, and then there's this very troubling case, the unknown unknowns, things we don't know we don't know. Uh, so what exactly are those classes we're missing uh, at testing time? Uh, we, we, we can't even conceptualize them because we have no notion. There's no basis to make that judgment. Uh, Rumsfeld, of course, here is talking about the September 11th style attacks, um, these things that we, we didn't even uh, think about anticipating. It was so fantastic to imagine something like that happening, and then it did. Um, and, and these are all well-known themes in Rumsfeld's career. So Rumsfeld, again, like while a divisive figure, is quite helpful to us uh, in, in machine learning uh, in retrospect. 
Um, so, so just to recap here, in, in machine learning we have known classes. Um, these are classes with distinctly labeled positive training examples, also serving as ne negative examples for other known classes. That makes sense uh, in a supervised learning context, which is mostly what we're going to be talking about today. Known unknown classes, these could be labeled negative examples, but they don't have specific labels indicating what class they came from. Imagine training something like a face detector. I have the positive class labeled faces, then I have a bunch of whole you know, smattering of random classes that I just slapped a label on This is negative. I don't really care what they are because I'm not trying to identify what they are. Um, I just need a sampling of negatives to create the classifier. And then, again, unknown unknown classes, classes unseen in training. Uh, and this is really what we're going to focus on in this talk, uh, because this is where machine learning doesn't give us good answers. So a few definitions. So we're clear, closed set recognition. When I invoke this term, or Terry invokes this term, this means all testing classes are known at training time. Uh, this is the basic machine learning we all know and love. Um, when we talk about open set recognition, we mean incomplete knowledge of the world is present at training time, and unknown classes can be submitted to an algorithm during testing. Um, this is, this is the problem we want to solve. So the burden for the visual recognition community, um, an important point here I think is number one, uh, results look better than they really are in many cases. I think most of you know this, you know, you, you read the paper, the results look great on the benchmark data set. Uh, you move the, the code or you re-implement the, uh, the algorithm and you move it to a new domain or some different data and lo and behold, the performance is not what you expected based on the claims of the paper. Um, a lot of what you're seeing may be some inf effect induced by the open set recognition problem. Even if you're within class, you're going to see a lot of novel examples, uh, especially for very broad visual classes. Uh, and that's a related phenomenon. Uh, and so this is a big, a big issue. Um, Off-the-shelf classifiers are not sufficient to solve the problem. Uh, I think many of you will recognize this right away. You can't just take um, you know, SVM off the shelf and apply it because it has no inherent way to reject unknown samples. Uh, it will happily give you labels for everything you trained with. Uh, but as unknown inputs come into the system, it becomes a bigger issue. Um, and then finally here, open set uh, recognition problems are found in nearly every case where recognition algorithms are present. Um, so this is interesting because it's not even just about computer vision. Um, this applies to natural language processing. This applies to other problems within signal processing. Um, there are many, many different domains where this pops up. Any, any general recognition problem will have this open set uh, problem. In fact, it, to me, it seems like there are very few closed set problems that are realistic that we should be solving. Uh, the things we really want to solve uh, end up being open set recognition problems. Um, so further motivation here, um, perhaps this is a surprising finding, or maybe not, because you, you've tried to uh, train on a limited data set and then generalize to something uh, with more unknown inputs. Um, we're all familiar with MNIST, right? The classic machine learning benchmark. It's handwritten digits, uh, 0 through 9. Um, we, we know that this is basically a solved data set. We use it as a sanity check in machine learning to make sure that the algorithm works before we move on to more complicated things. Um, and of course, if you look at the literature and you look at Jan LeCun's website, which has the results for basically every classifier known to man at this point, um, uh, the results are at ceiling. You know, it's like there's a few characters that are highly ambiguous, and then you know every algorithm basically is 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 perfect. And so you see this effect. So if you train with just six of the examples, it's great. Seven, eight, nine, ten uh, of of these different classes, um, you know, the, the performance doesn't vary very much. Um, but what's interesting. If you train, say, on digits 0 through 5, so 6 training classes, uh, and then bring at test time back those classes you left out, uh, seven, or 6, 7, 8, and 9, uh, the performance drops uh, quite, quite drastically. Um, so 1 versus REST SVM here, 1 versus REST SVM with a threshold applied so you can give it some rejection ability. Um, we're not on ceiling anymore here. Uh, and even uh, a state-of-the-art algorithm, which we'll talk about later, which is meant to deal with unknowns, drops in performance as well. Um, again, this is the most basic benchmark we have, uh, and it turns out to be quite difficult once you start uh, leaving things out at training time. Uh, so, you know, if we can't do this, should we be tackling the, the tougher problems? It's an important question. Um, what about deep learning? Everybody's really excited about deep learning, CVPR, this is deep learning central now uh, these days. Um, doesn't that just solve the problem, right? It's solving all these great problems for us. Um, the problem deep learning is meant to uh, address is really um, feature representation. Uh, of course, we all know this is computer vision 101. Um, the, the basics, we want features because in pixel space, we have a lot of entanglement. Uh, the pixels are corrupted with some noise. We don't know what that noise is in many cases a priori, but we want to extract invariant features 
to, to take that out of the picture. So we can imagine this pretend face classifier where we're trying to get features extracted for two individuals. And in pixel space, this fails. And, and we know that because it's tangled. Um, we can imagine um, making an analogy to the brain. Um, you know, V1-like features would be SIF, TOG, LBP, uh, all the things we used before deep learning. Uh, they worked, but there's still some entanglement. It starts to separate the space, uh, if you think of these uh, as sort of manifolds. Uh, but, um, you know, there's some overlap, and, and that's not ideal. You know, they work okay in many cases, but we want something like deep learning, which, you know, the story is um, we get very, very good separation with these learned invariant features. Uh, we can think of this as something like IT space in the brain, uh, higher level representations um, that are actually used uh, when you make a decision. Uh, and then this makes the classification problem very easy, we're told, because you can just throw a linear, exactly, linear SVM. Or, or, you know, uh, pick your favorite simple classifier because it doesn't matter. Uh, the features are so well separated in space, uh, you don't have to worry about this. Um, and you get right, an untangled representation. Um, so this is bad. We don't want the tangled space, which deep learning, again, supposedly solves. Um, but for open set recognition, um, is, is this good? Does this solve the problem? Do I, do I need to go on? Should we just cancel the tutorial? A anybody know why this is not sufficient? Yeah, Mark. Because the features always work with your training set. Exactly. The features, uh, in this case, work for two individuals. We have Sam and Joe. Um, but what if unknown individual number one pops up in the feature space, unknown individual two? Um, th this model says nothing about the unknowns. Um, right? The, the feature representations are tuned to the training data. Um, your linear classifier, which you slapped between uh, the two feature spaces, um, is only discriminating between those two. Um, and we still have this problem, so we're still stuck. Um, so a lot of this tutorial is going to be about what do you do uh, in, in this situation? Again, we have good features, but the decision-making piece has largely been ignored by the deep learning community. You know, softmax or linear SVM, we always use these, and it's no problem. Um, and, and it is a problem, as it turns out, because if you're using the softmax function, you're applying a summation over all the classes, but in open set recognition, you don't know what all the classes are, so that's not good. Uh, same deal with linear SVM. Uh, you have your known positive or known negative samples, but you can't really generalize well beyond those. Um, new classes aren't uh, baked into the formulation. Even if you take something very basic like cosine similarity, which I've seen in a lot of recent papers doing video to video matching, um, you have to estimate uh, an empirical threshold. And again, that's only based on the data you know about. Uh, so that doesn't help you either. Uh, and so you know, are there any alternatives? Uh, that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, again, deep learning has, has other issues. Uh, many of you may have seen this uh, talk last year at CVPR uh, by Jeff Kloon's group at the University of Wyoming. These fooling images, um, visually they look nothing like uh, the classes they're being labeled as. Um, this projector's not too hot, but whoops. I assure you every label here um, is drastically wrong. Uh, and you can think of this as being an open set style effect. Um, you know, somewhere uh, in the feature space, you ended up uh, far from where um, you should have been. Uh, and, and there was no good facility to reject these crazy inputs. Uh, and so that's been a big issue. Um, but as it turns out, you don't have to even use tricky manipulations uh, to fool the networks. Um, because, again, we're in an impoverished data regime, even in the, the age of big data where we can sample um, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of images from the web very easily, um, we're not capturing all the variants. And so when you train these networks, data comes in and that same data comes back out. Uh, so you can imagine the within class uh, situation being tricky as well. Uh, so notice um, these images uh, that have been mislabeled, hammerhead shark, Kind of looks like a hammerhead shark, uh, so maybe plausible. Blow dryer, I'm struggling to understand that. Mosk, really struggling to understand that uh, mislabeling. Syringe, trimaran. I mean, a jet, maybe a missile technically, but that's not the label I would have assigned uh, this image. Uh, so what my lab has been working on recently is very large scale uh, psychophysics experiments where we're generating millions of computer uh, generated scenes and feeding that to the networks. And in most of those cases, the networks fail drastically. And you can almost get back to the, the training data itself uh, by figuring out which images it's getting right. Because visually, in terms of, say, pose, if that's the condition we're varying, um, you get back the same poses that you trained with. And that's not terribly surprising. Uh, this is why we sample so many images with deep learning. 
Um, and so a big question we can ask is, um, you know, are performance measures really misleading us here? Um, do we think this is not a problem because the measures uh, we use are typically tuned for closed set classification as opposed to open set recognition? Um, Psychophysics is an interesting alternative here. This is commonly deployed in psychology and neuroscience to understand perceptual thresholds of people or animals. Um, but it turns out it's very useful for artificial intelligence as well. We can take any arbitrary model and start uh, performing a highly controlled experiment where we manipulate some condition like lighting, resolution, uh, pose, uh, occlusion is what we're showing here for face detection. Um, and you can right away see where uh, a particular model starts to uh, uh, fail, and in what regime does it actually work well in. And you can see here, this is just an example of some psychometric curves for face detection where we've looked at uh, Google, Picasa, and Facebook. Uh, and you can see um, better performance is towards this direction, so human performance is superior to machine performance, which for face detection is somewhat surprising to many people because your phone can do this and it looks like it works really well. Uh, but as it turns out, many of the models are, are tuned on training data meant for selfie style uh, uh, poses and not necessarily highly occluded faces, which of course um, we as humans need to uh, detect faces uh, under such conditions. Uh, you know, back in the day for evolutionary purposes of survival, um, today you know, it's a useful visual trait if your friend is you know, hiding behind a bush and you're trying to get their attention. Uh, you may want to be able to see that there's at least a face uh, behind the branches. Um, so you could imagine creating something like a psychophysics pipeline to start to tickle these uh, systems to understand what's going on. Um, our particular pipeline first tries to understand what the class canonical view of a particular object class is for a certain network. Um, this would be, say, uh, what is the highest confidence value coming out of softmax? Uh, choose that as your canonical view. Uh, and then have that, and then you can start to manipulate these variables, um, and then you can classify those images. And in most cases, we find that the, the deep learning kind of fails right away, uh, and there's a very narrow range of usable uh, images uh, with respect to whatever variable we're manipulating in the psychophysics experiment. And then we generate those curves, uh, like the ones I just showed you. Um, and here's just some more examples to, to nail this home. Um, this is, uh, of course, an airplane. Um, you can see this is a, a version without any Gaussian blur. Um, this is a version that has what I would consider to be moderate Gaussian blur. And even with the crummy projector, we can probably all tell, at least those of us with semi-decent <laughs> eyesight, that this is a plane, right? Not many people would, would assign a funny label to this. Um, but you can see that um, all of these networks, AlexNet, CafeNet, GoogleNet, and two variants of VGGNet, uh, have started to fail uh, long before um, we got to even this image. And we have much blurrier ones. I just cut this plot off uh, because the network's failed here and they don't get any better down the line. Uh, and so that's an interesting effect. And we can see this again here. How many people would think this is not a cat? Does anybody not think that this is a cat standing here? No, we can all see that. Um, but again, the, the networks are affected by this. This chicken is a little bit more difficult, I think. This kind of looks like a blob to me. So I understand why failure happened. Uh, out here, but notice all the networks failed much sooner. Yes? Yes, yeah, so, so the, the networks have all been trained in the ImageNet regime. These are the models right out of CAFE. Um, so, so we didn't do any, anything special. Um, we, we did absolutely no training. We just tried to understand where do these networks uh, apply. Uh, and we're told these are some of the, the state-of-the-art best object recognition models, and, and they're failing really quick. Uh, and so that doesn't give me much confidence that we've solved, you know, even this like within class variance issue. Um, and so it's not surprising that in an open set context, uh, these things do even worse. Um, so what standard options do we have to solve open set classification? Uh, we talked a little bit about classification in the first few slides. We talked a little bit about, you know, linear uh, uh, classifiers and things of the like. Um, there are a number of choices that are obvious because, again, we're familiar with the detection problem. Binary classification, of course, would be the first thing. Uh, because we can train with the positive class and then sample some negatives and then hope that we've done a good enough job sampling negatives uh, to be able to generalize and to reject unknown things. Um, but uh, if you're thinking about uh, ensembles of classifiers and building a true multi-class classifier, uh, this becomes problematic for a number of, number, of, excuse me, number of reasons. And also, even in the binary case, it's problematic. Uh, so you can imagine we have a classifier uh, 1 versus 2. Um, that helps us just with these classes, but class number 3 appears over here. Uh, and so it's being split uh, on both sides of the 1 versus 2 decision boundary. That's not helpful. Same thing for 1 versus 3 and 2 versus 3. 
um, you know, the binary classifier is just not sufficient for those other classes that we see. Uh, if you're combining them, you also have this troubling effect where the linear uh, boundaries uh, create these voids and, and data can appear there too. Um, and how do we label that? Um, that's not clear from the decision boundaries. Uh, so this is uh, a big issue. Um, you could think about multi-class one versus all classification, but again, you see the same kind of effects that you saw uh, with the binary classifier, uh, especially this void again in the middle where the decision boundaries form this triangle and it's not clear how you would label anything in that space. And so unknowns could of course in the future space end up there uh, and then the treatment is, is confusing. One of the best things I think conceptually for this problem is of course a one class classifier uh, like you can see here. Uh, forget about sampling any negatives because we know that's difficult when there's an infinite number of negative classes out there, practically speaking. Um, just fit some sort of decision boundary around the positive class data that you have and call it a day. Um, of course, there are some good algorithms to do this, or at least some good solvers. Uh, one class SVM is probably the first thing most people think about when uh, we have one class classifiers, but uh, Terry's going to tell you about uh, a few others. Um, the trouble here um, is, is over-specialization to the training data. Uh, since you had no negatives, you don't know how far to push the decision boundary uh, to generalize. And so you have a very uh, uh, tight decision boundary if you have something like a radial basis function, which of course is how uh, Sholkoff uh, originally formulated the one-class SVM. And uh, when we see novel examples of the positive class, they may be falling out here close to the decision boundary. And of course, we're rejecting them now, um, and that's a problem because those are false negatives. Um, so, ha has anybody tried the, a one class classifier or one class SCM yet? How well do they work in practice? It, it works well on my problem. On, on your problem, it worked. What, what was your problem? Uh, it was uh, free space. Okay. So, I bring the uh, one class SCM to so, the top, and it works pretty well, but mainly because the classes were defined. So, the geometric features of the free space. The ground plate, essentially. It's well defined, but uh, once you move, like a bit of off road scenes. Yeah, okay, it's sort of. Sort of layers, yeah. Okay, so it's still like a, a, the overfitting kind of was okay for your problem, but once you started to move to some other data, you saw this effect. Um, yeah, I think most people I talk to who have tried, because again, this is the first thing you think of. When I first started working on OpenSet, I was like, oh yeah, there's this one class SVM, you know, problem solved, I can get on with my life, but then, you know, it really just didn't work at all. Um, and, and so then we started to rethink uh, the whole algorithmic issue. Was there, is there some feedback there on the a little, sir? Let me see if I can, is this better? Yeah, maybe turn the volume down, sorry about that. Just wait till Terry adjusts that and we'll Testing, testing, one, two, three. That sounds better from here. A little bit. <laughs> yeah, that's, can you, oh, I still hear. Testing, testing, testing. <laughs> Hello, testing, one, two, three. It's just Avi, it's okay. <laughs> he's, he's heard this spiel before. Testing. That, that sounds better. Okay. Okay, so coming back to this idea of negative sampling. Um, so the binary classifiers are better for this problem than the positive, uh, or so the single one class classifiers. Um, but there's this question of, of the negatives. Um, and there's this great quote from a classic CVPR paper, CVPR 2001, uh, from Tom Wong's group, uh, where they had this, this quote, which is adapted from the opening line of the novel Anna Karenin by Tolstoy. Uh, all positive examples are alike, each negative example is negative in its own way. And this hints at this idea that, uh, again, you just, you don't have a good idea of what everything else in the world or universe looks like. Uh, and there's going to be a lot of interesting peculiarities in those individual classes, and you can't model all that uh, when you're trying to do uh, negative class sampling. Um, it's, it's just intractable. Um, but, but that's a huge problem because there's all of this, uh, uh, you know, sort of unique feature space out there. Um, that you can't account for. Um, and so what do you do? Um, vision problems here I've ranked in order of what we call openness, and I'll explain what openness is uh, momentarily. Um, 
Of course, uh, we have closed set classification, which again is our, our typical setup in computer vision. Um, you know, here, small example, three classes, um, goldfish, shell, turtle. Um, you know, this is the Caltech 101 style, you know, imagery, uh, you know, it's like draw these boundaries, no problem. Training and testing samples come from the known classes. Um, uh, what this slide is trying to get at, um, not all problems are equally open. Uh, some may have some measure of openness um, that is more or less than other problems. So if you work in face, face verification is an open set problem technically, uh, but you only have faces to worry about. You don't have a lot of other objects. Um, where the open set problem comes in, uh, it's with imposters. So if you think of an authentication system, uh, which is you know, typically uh, what, where we use biometric systems. Um, you know, I sit down at my computer, I go to authenticate. Um, if it's me, it's a one-to-one -one matching scenario and the match will be correct and I can log in. If someone else, one of you, sits down at my computer and tries to authenticate, um, you're now an imposter. And this, of course, is an open set issue because uh, you provided no training data to the system in many, most cases. Uh, especially if, again, it's um, single computer, one-to-one -one style matching. Um, so we have claimed identity, possibility for imposters, but um, you know, maybe not a huge possibility depending on the setting uh, the system is deployed in. Uh, object detection, a far more open problem, but in detection we typically only treat uh, a handful of classes at most. Uh, so you think of you know, a pedestrian detector, that would just be one class and everything else in the world is then a negative, we just want to reject. And then we have full-blown open set recognition, which is many, many positive classes uh, in this massive sea of unknown inputs. Uh, and this is the problem we really want to uh, tackle. Because this is what leads to full scene understanding in computer vision. Uh, again, it's, it's not a big deal if your problem uh, is well-defined. But as long as there's some unknown inputs like we have in, in face verification, this still becomes a big problem. Um, so formalizing openness, I used this term informally just before. Um, Terry and I have, have offered this following definition uh, where you can actually take um, some data set that you have available uh, for evaluation purposes. Of course, you can't do this in the real world since, again, the unknowns become problematic. Uh, but for the purposes of, of benchmark testing, uh, you can think of it this way. Um, there are three categories of classes here. Uh, training classes, which could be positive and or negative classes, known negatives. Um, target classes, uh, maybe that's just the positive classes you're interested in labeling. So remember in, in the supervised learning we can have um, negative samples that have no specific semantic label, they're just negatives. Uh, so they may not factor into the number of target classes we're trying to assign labels to. And then of course testing classes, which could be uh, massively large. Uh, and, and ideally if we're doing good open set style testing, uh, we want a very, very large sampling of unknowns. Now, of course, I just showed you MNIST, and it was dealing with just four unknowns. Um, but, you know, it, you, know you, want, you want a decent sampling uh, if, if you want to do this realistically. Um, so some examples, once you compute this little formula, um, you're going to get a value between 0 and 1. Uh, and uh, for closed set multi-class classification, of course, um, you don't even have to solve the problem. It's just a zero openness. Uh, for face verification, you can consider that, again, a, a weaker open set problem. So if you had 12 targets, 12 training classes, and then 50 testing classes, uh, factoring in some imposters, um, you would get this, this measure of openness uh, of 0.38. Uh, typical detection, maybe we have one target, uh, a lot of training data, but a massively large uh, testing sample. Um, maybe that gives us an openness of 0.55, and so on. Uh, we can think of object recognition scenarios. Uh, where we have very limited training uh, in terms of negative classes because we don't know a lot about the world, but we have a large sampling of test classes again. Um, and that means uh, even though we had fewer examples here, uh, because the class space was so large and we didn't have much training data, the openness turns out to be larger. Um, is this the only way we could assess openness? No. Um, one could probably think of many different alternatives. Uh, in fact, I encourage all of you to think of alternatives because this is certainly an open question. Um, so with that knowledge in mind, um, can we go back to statistical pattern recognition and try to find formulations uh, that are amenable in this regime? Uh, so you know, go back to the old literature from Vapnik, uh, et cetera. Um, you often find this, this kind of expression here. Um, you want to minimize in statistical pattern recognition uh, something that is labeled ideal risk. Um, and that can be precisely defined as integrating over the product of a loss function which of course is assigning penalties to misclassifications coming out of the learn recognition function f. 
based on the feature vectors x uh, and the label which you have is you have the ground truth data at training, uh, checking the answers um, and assigning penalties. Usually the farther away you are from the correct answer, the more penalty is assigned. Uh, pretty familiar if, if you've been working on, on classification at all in machine learning. And then this joint distribution of uh, the labels uh, y and the training data uh, feature vectors x. Um, the problem here for open set recognition, um, th this joint distribution is completely undefined uh, because we don't have an exhaustive sampling of everything you could possibly see, uh, so that becomes a big problem. Um, coupling that with uh, the typical linear classifier setup, um, and I hinted at this before, um, imagine we have some positive training data. Um, here it's dogs. This is again like Peltec 101 style imagery. Um, and then we have some sampling of negatives, uh, frogs, birds, owls. Um, and we created this classifier. You know, it's a max margin classifier. We did a good job. Here's the margin. Um, we got good separation between the negatives and the positives. All right, end of the story, we're done. Um, if we go out into the real world and start to take in any visual input, maybe we're classifying images out there on the web, uh, and we find a picture of a raccoon, um, and it shows up uh, out here. Um, it's far away from the support of the positive training data. Um, it was in a space uh, that was more or less open. Remember I mentioned this issue of open space at the very beginning? Um, and, and this highlights the problem with a linear classifier. You have half spaces that extend to infinity. If you are really, really far away from the training data and you're getting valid data points and blindly assigning labels, that could be a big problem. Um, what would be nice for linear classifiers is perhaps a back decision plane uh, and create this slab model where you can reject something that's out here. And we'll talk about one particular model for that later on. Um, but anytime you have a linear classifier, you can have this set up. And anytime you have an open set recognition problem, uh, this effect is always going to happen. So a little bit more about open space. It's the space far from known training data. Um, that's obvious based on what we just discussed in the previous slide. Uh, we need to address the infinite half space problem of linear classifiers. Um, if you look at the, the probability and statistics literature, you may find this idea of principle of indifference. Um, you could just say, no problem, I'll assign equal probability to everything out there in that open space and not worry about it. Uh, but typically when we're creating classifiers in machine learning, we need the distribution to integrate to one. We can't do that if we statically assign uh, the same probability to everything extending into affinity. That's a big problem. Um, so an alternative here um, is to reformulate the problem and incorporate a notion of open space risk. And instead of just minimizing that empirical loss uh, multiplied right, by some notion of the joint distribution, uh, we want to minimize the risk of having all of that uh, open space right, that extends to infinity. Uh, if we can somehow limit that, maybe we can do a better job at eliminating unknowns affecting our, our classifier. Uh, so one definition here we're offering Open space risk is the relative measure of open space to the full space of, of the learned classifier. Um, what does that mean? So open space is pretty clear, I think, from what I just described. Open space plus the positive training examples um, becomes the full space. Uh, so we have some space that's defined by whatever we retained in our model from the training data. And so that's a region we have fairly high confidence about when it comes to assigning labels. And so we account for that um, here and then just divide the full open space by this. Uh, so the bigger the, the open space risk is, the more trouble you may have with open set recognition. Um, just going to define a few uh, 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 training uh, uh, issues here. So preliminaries, space of positive class data, we're just going to say is P. Uh, the space of other known class data, we'll say is K. Um, so again, thinking back to the Rumsfeldian taxonomy, um, you know, known, known knowns kind of exist up here. Uh, we're going to have our positive training data, uh, which is sampled from the space of positive class data. Our negative training data um, is going to be sampled from the space of the known class data in general. Uh, unknown negatives appearing in testing, we're going to call U. Uh, and then we're going to take our whole set here, uh, call it uh, testing data. It's going to be the known positives, it's going to be the known negatives, and it's also going to be some of these other unknowns. Uh, now again, let me emphasize, this is just for the purposes of evaluation. In practice, we don't know what the unknowns are. That's the problem we're trying to address. Uh, but we can get some notion of that uh, if we have uh, a well-defined training and testing data uh, for evaluation. And then everything we talk about, we're going to assume the problem openness is greater than zero unless we specifically say that the problem is closed set. 
uh, then of course it's zero. It, it's just, it's just, unknown, they're, they're, uh, so this is a good question. So are there unknown positives and unknown negatives? Um, the answer is yes, we could have unknown positives if we're trying to incrementally learn new classes and fold them in. And Terry's going to say a few words about that later on, much later on. Yeah, 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 that's, uh, we're going to build simply uh, and then try to, you know, scale to more advanced uh, uh, solutions. But that's a great question uh, because you can have both, uh, depending on what your problem is and what your, your objectives are for solving it. Okay, so the open set recognition then becomes the following. We're going to minimize open set risk, uh, which is our open space risk, which is associated with the unknown. So the, the formula I just gave you. Um, it's also going to include empirical risk based on the training data we have. That's just standard operating procedure in any training regime for supervised learning. Uh, and that will incorporate our known positives and our known negatives. And we may have some regularization constant as well. Um, so what's missing from our definition of open space risk? Um, basically what's missing here um, is uh, how do we define open space? Um, I haven't told you how to uh, figure this out yet. Um, I've simply said that it exists and we have to estimate it somehow uh, from the positive uh, and negative samples that we know ahead of time. Um, so, so the definition here doesn't tell us how to define O. So that's one big question we need to address. 